But again, we do want to thank you for your support. And uh, this is my 43rd year as a missionary to the Jews. And so uh, we, we thank the Lord for using us in, in right now among the Lubavitch Jewish community, the Lubavitch Jewish community. And so uh, I, I uh, pray that you'll pray for them, all right, and the doors that God has opened there for us. It is an honor to be with you tonight, to share with you, and I do use notes. I'm 63, and I use notes. The last thing you want me to do is stand up here and ramble, right? And we got kids, I know, so they can wind down, so we're not going to be that long. But uh, it is uh, fun to be with you tonight and share our collection of uh, Roman armor from the first century AD. This is authentic replicas, museum grade authentic replicas of Roman armor from the first century AD. And uh, we've just been able to collect it over the years. Dr. Cameron, who founded Seaside Mission, collected Bibles, and I have kept up with that and collect Bibles. And then, of course, uh, you think, how did all this come about? Let me just say this. My mother says her daughter-in-law lives with a hoarder. I argue and say, no, she just lives in a museum, okay? But uh, I appreciate my wife putting up with the stuff that I like to collect, all right? But uh, I, in all sincerity, one of the great ways of learning the word of God is to visualize it, to visualize the word of God. And, and of course, I, I want to be a student of the word, and I want to know the culture of the Bible and in the context in which it was written. And of course, being a law enforcement officer, I'm a part-time, I do not get paid for being a law enforcement officer, I'm not double dipping, my main job is a missionary to the Jews, but I volunteer as a reserve deputy with the Orange County Sheriff's Office, and I'll explain why I bought my two pieces of equipment in a minute. But uh, I, 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 having said that, I'm into weapons, I'm an uh, adjunct firearms instructor with my agency, and so, you know, hey, the Lord told his disciples to go buy a sword, right, in Luke 22. And I, I just I can think, well, you know, what kind of sword would they buy back then? And so we'll show you here in a minute. Okay, but that's how it all started unfolding. I thought, well, when the Lord got stabbed with a spear, you know, what, what, what kind of Roman spear was that, you know? And, and what were the centurions? How did they dress back then? So that's how all this started, all right? So, um, but, but it's great to visualize the word of God. Um, hey, Take a trip to Israel and see the land of Israel for yourself and tell me that won't help you read the Bible in a totally different light. Amen? Go to the Louvre or the National Museum of Cairo or the British National Museum or the Smithsonian Institute and see the authentic biblical artifacts. I mean, authentic biblical artifacts that are in those museums. I, I'm telling you right now, one of the greatest museums that promotes the veracity of the Old Testament is the Cairo National Museum, right? They're in the heart of the 99% Muslims. Obviously, they don't advertise it, but you go to the Cairo National Museum and you can find biblical artifacts that substantiate and support the stories of the Old Testament. It's just amazing. And, and that, so that's what we mean when we're talking about visualizing the Word of God. And so I hope tonight uh, this will stir you to study the Word of God and take a trip to Israel. Amen? And uh, ask God to provide you that way. I know I have a sister-in-law, Susan's youngest sister, is on her way to Israel tonight with her husband, Mark, who's Jewish. So we're praying for their safety. Hey, with that being said, take your Bibles and turn to eyes, uh, Excuse me, Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, and as you turn there, uh, before we delve into the Romer of the Ar Romer, Armin Romer, Roman armor of God tonight, uh, don't get old, all right? We're allowed to get older, but don't get old, okay? But uh, let me go ahead and explain this to you tonight, okay, what we've brought so far. And I'll start down on this side. You see we have two shields. This is called the Parma shield. Uh, what I do like about this shield is it's covered in leather, and the Romans would cover their shields in leather before battle, and they would soak it, make it wet. Why? And I'll tell you in a minute why they would do that. But the, obviously the arrows, the golden arrows, uh, represented uh, the god Jupiter and his defense of them in battle. You have the eagles that represented the uh, a Roman army. Uh, this is a Parma shield. Obviously, it's oval shaped. Uh, your auxiliary Roman soldiers would carry this. Your cavalry and your auxiliary. What do we mean by auxiliary? 
when the Roman legion would defeat another army, and some of those soldiers would want to say, hey, I want to join you instead of being defeated by you. They were considered auxiliary soldiers. And so they would be given the Parma shield as opposed to the scotum down at the end. Uh, this is what uh, the infantry legionary, Roman armor legion, carried the scotum shield. And uh, it was like a door. The green wreath represents victory. Uh, this has red in it. You'll see that the Roman soldiers wore red. That's the color of war. And uh, this is a boss. If This was made of wood. And, and again, these are authentic replicas of how they made them. And the handle was horizontal as opposed to being vertical. But they would take the handle. And, and let me just say this right now. I, I, I do not want to present myself as a Roman armor expert, okay? I just want to, I've been reading. I want to be studious. And this is what I've learned. And if you've heard something different, you're allowed to correct me. But this is what we can read, obviously, on the internet and in books. But this is the boss. They could use this to punch people, you know, punch them and then stab them or whatever. But this is the scotum. And this is what, uh, no doubt, what Paul was thinking about. And because this was what was given to the soldiers of that, Roman army soldiers of that day. You have your shields. We have two Roman soldiers with us. This is your regular infantryman. He would wear the lorica segmentata. This has obviously different sheaves of Roman armor. You can see his belt. This is Baltus, his belt. The girdle, if you will. And we're going to look at these in Ephesians 6. Um, this is his helmet. Uh, you can see over here, though, this is my favorite Roman character. This is, anyone guess? Centurion. This is how you designated the centurion in scripture, the red crest. This is horse hair that was dyed red, but this is what designated a Roman centurion. Initially, Roman centurions wore the full body armor, a muscle karyas, and so this is why this is different than a regular infantryman. So this um, covered from, they would say, neck to navel. This is his belt here. And again, both of them are wearing red. Uh, I love these right here. This is, this is, again, authentic replica of Roman sandals. And you see they had nails, had like three layers of uh, leather, and then hobnails put in them to give them sturdiness on the battlefield. Uh, before we go to the swords, I do love this. This is one of my favorite Roman. This is, again, a, a replica now of a first century purse, military purse. This is called a Camaccio bag. There is an Italian city called Camaccio, and they began to drain their canals. And they drained one in particular, and they found an ancient Roman ship that was wrecked, and it was settled at the bottom. And everything was perfectly preserved. And so they found military supplies in that uh, wreckage, and uh, they came across one of these that was preserved. It's a leather purse. Hey, in Scripture, talking about the Lord Jesus told his disciples, you know, I sent you without purse or whatever, you know. This is a first century. It could have very well been what the disciples carried with them. I think that's very interesting. I did just throw this in. This is an ancient slingshot. Uh, think about David and Goliath. Uh, this is uh, real ancient, so I just threw that in there. Um, Roman spear here. Um, mom and dads, I don't care if they touch, but please be with them so they don't swing it on somebody accidentally, you know. But this is a pilum. I've heard people say pilum. Others say pilum. There were two type of Roman spears, the heavy pilum. Uh, it had a ball right here, heavy ball, and it was designed, it was more of a javelin. And so when the Roman soldier would throw the heavy pilum, it was designed to hit the shield and break. Uh, why? Because it wanted to um, put the soldier defenseless. He, never, he cannot use his shield now. And now they can hit him with an arrow or attack him with a sword. And, and also the heavy pilum would break once it hit the armor or the shield and it could not be picked up and used back against the Roman soldiers. So that was the heavy pilum. This is called the thin pilum. And uh, this is probably, uh, we could argue, what the Lord Jesus was, was pierced with on the cross, all right? The Roman pilum here. Um, the thin pilum, they call it. Uh, 
I might as well go ahead and say it. This is, this is one of my favorites. Uh, this is a Roman gladius. Um, again, they're all dull. The first Roman gladius I got, I was so excited to find one because these are hard to find. This is an actual replica of uh, a uh, Roman gladius from, um, oh, the name, just the, the town that was destroyed by the uh, Mount Vesuvius, Pompeii. Okay, don't get old. But obviously this is, I, I got it dull, so if anyone does pick it up, you know, it's still pointy here. But the first Roman Gladius I bought, I thought, no, no, you can buy them sharpened. And so I got it sharpened, but then I thought, wait a minute, I can't display that now. Because, you know, somebody will cut themselves. But this is an actual Roman replica from a Roman Gladius sword, 79 AD. And so uh, this is what your Roman soldier would carry. Your centurion would carry this and a pugio. It was a small dagger. And so that's what these are, Roman gladius swords. Uh, I, I, I am in the camp with those who argue when the Lord told his disciples to go buy a sword. The common sword of that day would have been a Roman gladius. And so, uh, you know, I, I can see maybe the disciples owning this one in particular. You know, this is kind of a style and uh, carrying it with them. So my sword today is my weapon, my, you know, my, my guns. That's at least what I tell my wife. All right, let's, um, let me just, this real quick here. I meant to mention this one. Now, this is not mentioned in Ephesians 6, but this is a, called a Roman Vetus. A Roman Vetus, this is a naughty vine staff. You read Roman history. Centurions, they were not nice guys. And... Uh, the Lord Jesus met three centurions in the Bible. He met three centurions in the Bible. He met, uh, can you think of them? Well, let me, uh, well, he met the one that healed his servant, right? He met the other centurion at the cross, right? What was the other centurion he met in scripture? Cornelius. Did he not meet him in salvation? Amen. He had... Peter go and talk to him about the gospel, and Peter said he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I don't know about you, but I think we can still meet, I know we can meet the Lord Jesus, amen, when he saves you. I um, mean, he reveals himself to you. So those are three Roman centurions we know the Lord Jesus met in scripture. But a Roman centurion would, would carry a, a Roman vetus, and this was a club. And they would club soldiers who did not obey them, or do it the way they wanted to do it. Hey, the Lord Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane, when, when the soldiers came, you know, and with uh, Judas and all that, he's saying, why have you come to me with swords and what? Staves? Check out the Greek word. It was a club. And that's why your modern translations will say a staff or a club. Could have very well been like the Roman Vetus that they would carry. So that's why I brought this. Uh, they were not nice guys all the time. Um, hey, I do have dice here. Again. These are authentic replicas of first century Roman dice. They're made out of sheep bone or goat bone. I mean, they look like our dice today, don't they? Uh, where do you find the dice used in Scripture? In the New Testament, in Jesus' life. When they cast lots for his friends. Yes, they had those back then. Uh, Tiberius and all of them, they were known as dicers. They like to roll the dice. Isn't that amazing? And, you, and these are made out of sheep's bone or goat bone. That's what they're here for. And uh, my favorite. These are, now, these are um, plumbata, Roman darts. Um, Roman soldiers would carry them. They, some would say behind the, they'd have them stacked behind their shield. And they would throw these darts, hoping to hit the enemy in the helmet or something like that. And so they do have longer ones. Now, your scholars will argue that the plumbatas didn't come until like third century. But I will argue in Ephesians 6, in 50 AD, Paul is talking about the fiery darts of the wicked one. He's using imagery. I mean, he's using Roman armor, uh, you know, to describe what he's seeing. In his, and he's talking about the fiery darts of the wicked one. So there were some type of fiery darts. But hey, have you gotten hit by a fiery dart today from the wicked one today? How do we defend ourselves, amen? But these are one of my favorites. These are very hard to get, and so we were fortunate to find them. I think that, yes? 
And yes, some of them would wrap them in fire or, you know, have a cloth and throw it in the fiery darts. And so that's what we get from that, that uh, thought. Um, I'll talk about this later. I'm trying to think of anything I've missed. All right. We're in Ephesians chapter 6. Um, <clears throat> In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17, the Apostle Paul is speaking metaphorically. That is, he is using imagery. He's using the Roman armor of the first century Roman soldier to emphasize the need and the how-to for a believer to overcome the forces of darkness that fight against them on a daily basis. Let's read now, beginning with verse 10, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles. The King James says wiles. Your modern translations will say schemes. The schemes of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins, or we would say today, your hips, or your waist, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and then your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Let's add verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. How can I, on a daily basis, stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil? You are attacked. I'm attacked daily. How can we stand against his schemes? Well, to do that, we must apply or appropriate the following principles or spiritual truths that this armor speaks of and that God has made available to every child of us. You know, he's made the whole armor of God available to every child of his. By the way, according to verse 12, we first need to recognize who our true enemy is. Have you done that? We all have enemies, amen? amen. Ultimately, my enemy, my personal foe, is not those who live and work in Washington, D.C. Would you remember that? I disagree with a lot, probably everyone who lives there, but they're not my, they're not my enemy. Ultimately speaking, they're not my enemy. Um, Hey, it's not some organized crime syndicate that's my personal enemy. Uh, It is not my neighbor or the person sitting next to me or across from the aisle in church, right? These all may be pawns in our battle against evil, but our most dangerous adversary are the spiritual or adversaries are the spiritual forces of hell that Paul mentions in verse 12. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Amen? We have a spiritual enemy that's very powerful. And we cannot defeat him in our own strength. You know, and you surely know the verse, Zechariah 4, 6, not by might, by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Not by human might, not by human power, but by my spirit, and I would add, if you'll allow me, by the spirit and his resources that he affords us, amen? Because he does afford us resources. And so how are we to literally play this out? Um, First, according to verse 13, we must put on the whole armor of God. The whole, or full, or every piece of armor. 
We must put on. What good would it be? Now, this is why I always like to bring my, bring my law enforcement equipment with me. Now, you know, when I'm on regular patrol, I have 40 pounds of gear on me. 40 pounds of gear. And this is what I'm supposed to put on if I'm called to a school shooting. I'm supposed to put on this helmet, ballistic helmet, and uh, this thing right here. Let me just ask you to hold it here for a moment. That's pretty heavy, Eddie. They're wanting me to put this on if I'm in call to a school shooting. Uh, it's funny, we still have breastplates, right? But good night of living, including myself, most deputies won't make it up the first steps of flight with all this gear on, right? For me, I want to be mobile and agile. But, but my point is, going on duty, I'm not going to carry my vest and leave my weapon at home, Right? That would be foolish. You understand the point here now when Paul says, in order to defeat Satan, we have to have the whole armor of God on. Hallelujah. So remember that. Um, put on these resources that are made available to you. Put them on. You're not born with them. Amen? You're not born with them. You have to put them on. They're made available to you. That means every day I... Must, as verse 14 says, I must girt my loins or my waist about with truth. What does it say? Verse 14. Stand therefore having your loins girt with, about with the truth. Again, this is what the belt that the soldier would wear. And this is what Paul would be looking at. This one is black. That one's in brown. It's the girdle. Um, Having on, we've got to have it on. Now, what is this? What do I take it? I take it to mean I dare not leave my house without my belt on. Uh, uh, when I go on patrol, I have a duty belt. You know, that duty belt supports my body to carry more equipment. You hear me? I have to wear my duty belt to put on all my other 30 pounds of equipment. It's the belt of truth. I have to be saturated, saturated with the truth, all right? Um, I dare not leave my house with my belt off. Uh, my, my duty belt as a law enforcement officer supports and sustains my body to carry the other needed equipment. Don't leave home without the belt of truth. In other words, don't leave home without being saturated with the truth, supported by the truth, amen? We have to have it. That's what sustains us. In this world of fight. Uh, next verse 14 says, having on, having on the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, again, we have two styles of breastplate. Uh, one was worn by the infantry, the other one by the officer. I, 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 again, I would not go on patrol without my vest. Uh, it reminds me, when I wear my vest, and this is one reason why I bring it, it reminds me of one thing. It, it always identifies who I am. I'm the sheriff. I'm representing the sheriff, and it protects me. It identifies me, and it protects me. So when I, spiritually speaking, put on the breastplate of righteousness, I see myself clothed in Jesus' righteousness, and it identifies who I'm serving and whom I'm depending on. I have to have that mental attitude that it's he I am serving, not living for myself, I'm serving him, and he's the one protecting me. Um, you know, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, Paul refers to it as the breastplate, breastplate of faith and love. You know what I like to think about when I think of the breastplate? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on his name. Amen? That's his breastplate. That's who protected My enemies will... Only be reminded of who I am and who I serve if I have on the breastplate of his righteousness. I'm working in his power. Amen? I'm obeying his word. Verse 15 says, Our feet must be shod with the preparation or the readiness of the gospel of peace. In law enforcement, there's a company that's called Victus. Victus, that's a derivation of the Latin word invictus. The Latin word invictus means unconquered. And so this company 
sells themselves as Victus. And uh, the other day they had an um, advertisement for shoes. And you know what the advertisement title was? Weaponize your feet. <laughs> Weaponize your feet. In other words, you've got to have the right shoe to do what you're called upon to do. Uh, someone said, wear shoes that will help you accomplish your mission. I love that, right? There's just some shoes we don't work to work, or we don't wear to work, right? And others that we wear to church. Uh, Roman soldiers wore sandals, as I showed you. Um, Caliga, these sandals were known for having the soles studded with hobnails. And uh, these sandals were designed to help the Roman soldier uh, be mobile, flexible, and sturdy, and ready, ready to respond to the call. Today, Christian, there's a raging battle over souls, amen? Both adults and children. Do we not agree with that? A raging battle, and we need the, the, the gospel, the shoes of our gospel on our feet to preach the gospel to those who are against us. Hey, you can't go without the sandals of peace, amen? We have to have the sandals, the gospel ready to proclaim. As we go, we must, above all, hey, did you see that? I love that in verse 16. Above all, that shows a priority, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Again, the scotum to my right, which would be to your left, that no doubt is the shield that Paul was visualizing as he was inspired by God to write this letter. Uh, that was the common shield of the Roman soldier. And um, hey, that's what we use to defend ourselves against the fiery darts of the wicked one. Christian, there are a whole lot of fiery darts coming our way on a daily basis. When I say fiery darts, I think of thoughts. You know, thoughts that I'm thinking, where did this thought come from? You know, I, I remember Dr. Cameron the man I studied under, the one who founded uh, Seaside Mission, and he was a Bible college uh, teacher, president. And I remember the story of him when he was a young man, young preacher, sitting on the, on the porch of his house in Tennessee, just reading the Bible, preparing for a next message. And all of a sudden, the thought just came to him out of nowhere. I'm so glad I heard him tell this story. He just said, out of nowhere. Now, I mean, he'd been through Bible school, seminary, He's studying for his next message, and all of a sudden, a thought just came to him. God's not real. God's not real. I, you know, that's a crazy thought. Just kind of brushed it off, but it kept, it kept coming. It got to the point, he said, when I would stand on Sunday to preach, that thought would just come. There's no God. Why, why, why are you doing this? He was so embarrassed, he wouldn't tell anyone. He was like, what's going on? Am I that crazy? And he just, he had to plead to the Lord, Lord, what is going on with me? You know, what's, what, what? And just one day he was reading in Isaiah, and it says, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Lord shall lift up a standard against him and rescue his servant. And he said, that's what happened. Just one day the Lord, you know, gave me the peace to overcome this thought. I, I, I take that to happen, friend, even today. You and I can have thoughts that, where do they come from? Out of left field. A temptation, right? Don't look at me like a deer in the headlight, like, you know? You're not a robot, all right? And, and, and we have these thoughts, and, and how, do we, how do we defend ourselves against them? What are we to do? The Bible tells us it's the shield of faith. Do you know what our SWAT team did the other day? They sent out a... Um, policy on, on how they address certain situations, and, and, and when they do find themselves in a traumatic situation, they're getting ready to face a man with a gun in the house or whatever. Do you know what two things they do? They told us in this policy to help us, you know, who, us lesser mortals, you know, than SWAT, you know. They said we do two things. We do military breathing to control our, you know, fear, and we do, get this, we do self-talk. They do self -talk talk. I will argue David is doing self-talk in Psalm 42 when he says, oh my soul, why art thou so cast down? Hold thou in God. You have to do self-talk on occasion, friend. Self-talk the word of God to yourself. 
Quote those verses to yourself. Read them. That's the shield of faith we're using to defend ourselves from these fiery thoughts. Um, to accompany such protection, we must take the helmet of salvation. Amen. It's available, but did you see where he said you must take it? Again, you weren't born with the helmet of salvation on. It's available to you. Uh, I, I, again, I, I take the helmet of salvation is the word of God protecting my mind. Hey, someone said, Christian, your mind is Satan's battleground. He who governs your thinking controls you. He who governs your thoughts controls you you and I want the word of God to control my thinking I don't know about you but the older I've been getting I wake up with panic attacks I'm not ashamed to admit that I wake up with panic attacks and uh, my grandfather would struggle with panic attacks and he got to the point where he wouldn't leave the house he would not leave the house I remember reading about a lady in England she would have panic attacks that she couldn't turn right it's, I, I know they're crazy but she would be driving a car and she just, she had a fear of turning right. So she had to work a map out where she could get to her location turning continually left to get to her. I mean, it's like, I know those phobias are cr crazy. Amen? They are wacko. You know, and, I, and I'm telling you right now, the older I get, I, I get panic attacks and thinking, wow, Lord, help. Um, I won't go there, but anyways, hey, we, we need the shield of faith, and we need the helmet of salvation on. The helmet of salvation buffers, it absorbs the thoughts of discouragement and despair. Dare we leave, dare we get out of bed without putting the helmet of salvation on, amen? I don't know about you, but I got to have that helmet on. I've got to have, and the, I can honestly look at you in the face. First thing I do with my phone in the morning... Trust me, I don't turn to CNN or Fox and see what the latest news is or the latest notification. Are you kidding me? I am not going to start my day out that way. I'm going to turn to, I use the Bible version, and I want to know what the first verse is that day. I have to have that word of God penetrating my mind and start my day out. I have to do that. Christian, you must do that. Finally, my favorite Roman tool during the first century was the Roman gladius. And that was the sword preferred among the Roman soldiers. Paul likens the sword unto the word of God. Amen. We have to have the word of God with us. He says in Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. Amen. Well, I love all this imagery that God is giving us. And when we look at these, and these were first century, you know, imagery that Paul was using and, and using how we are to defeat our enemy. I, I have to ask many Christians, um, Really, truly, sincerely, do you think, do you think Satan fears you if you don't care the sword of the spirit? I mean, you know, I have to, I mean, there's two things I have to, as we close, let's just close on this. Um, hey, friend, the Bible says resist the devil and he will flee from you. But seriously, do you think the devil is going to flee from you if you don't have the whole armor of God on? Seriously? you imagine me going to a domestic violence call and I'm just there with my flashlight? Seriously? You think anyone's going to, you know, think, oh, you know, he means business. I better obey him, right? Seriously? Friend, also, Paul tells us, he told Timothy, endure thou hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. How can you endure without the armor of God? Seriously? We have to have it. Hey, one last We find this on the Roman road. Amen. The gift of God is eternal life. Praise God as a Roman soldier. This is what we want to share with people, right? Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. We want to take people down to the Roman road and share the gospel with them. Amen. God help us to do that. Brother Casey. Speaking of the gospel, Jesus died on the cross and rose again for those who would believe in him. Amen. And uh, if you haven't been saved, you've placed your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you haven't fallen underneath the conviction of um, the fact that you are a sinner in need of a savior, tonight's a good night. And Pastor David Bill's done a great job in presenting the fact that uh, you have to...
put on the armor in order to Amen. be able to walk as a Christian, but you can't walk as a Christian unless you're a Christian. Amen. And you can't put on the armor of God unless you know him. And so this is all spiritual here. And for the spiritual person to be able to utilize this, and after you put on your armor, you pray. That's the most effective way to move forward. And let us not forget to put on the armor. But as Pastor David builds such a great job of uh, presenting the armor today, I also want to give the opportunity for anyone who has never um, received Christ uh, to just take a moment to consider the fact that um, you'll never go to heaven without believing in the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul, in particular, pleaded on behalf of God, be reconciled to God. And so that is our plea tonight as well as we go and sharpen our sword as well and knowing the word of God through the armor. So let's pray together. Father, if anyone here has um, by chance fallen underneath conviction of just hearing about the free gift of salvation, I pray, Father, that they would truly yield to you. Uh, we never know, Father. There's, you said in your word that there are wheats and tares uh, among those who are in church. And we always want to have the opportunity whenever you prompt us to yield to that and to spread the gospel. And so, Father, if there would be one whom you would be drawing closer to you by the power of your Holy Spirit, please help them, dear God, to be saved and place their trust in you and not themselves. It's very clear in the beginning of this passage as to um, being strong in you. And those who are not saved are strong in themselves. And at the end of the day, they'll find out just how weak that is. I pray, Father, that we would be lights and truly um, give credit where credit is due when we wear our armor and you help us to walk as Christians that we would give you due honor, glory, and praise. We do love you. Thank you so much, Father, for our missionary, Pastor David Bill, and his wife Susan and their family and friends and bringing the armor here for us to be able to see. We pray a special blessing upon them. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. amen.